Um, Ajwachi, I am the communications specialist at IFAM, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is part of the New Cats IFAM mini series, which is within the larger IFAM seminar series. And the, the mini series is called the Translational Applications and Public Health series. And we're joined today by Mike Wolf, who is a member of New Cats and the director of IFAM's Center for Applied Health Research on Aging, or CARA. He'll be presenting on the aging research taking place within CARA with a focus on the COVID-19 pandemic and the recent Pepper Center Award granted to the center. Welcome, Mike. Great, thank you so much. And uh, appreciate uh, having another opportunity in 2020 to uh, do the lecture series and give a little bit of update over uh, what has happened over the past 12 months with CARA is it kind of is now one year old. And uh, yes, if you were like me, maybe you wanted to shatter your screen with Zoom calls over the past uh, nine months, you know, you know, eight, 10, 12 a day for some of you, I'm sure. But uh, we're hoping to share a little bit of our gripes, but also a lot of the wins and successes and also put faces to the many names that make up CARA in this kind of presentation. So I'm just gonna walk through, I think in this presentation, a few things that one just kind of reintroduces you to what CARA is about, and then also a bit more about uh, some of the many highlights that uh, despite kind of a, a very rocky year, uh, especially in its first newly minted year of, as a center within IFAM, uh, what's been happening. And hopefully maybe uh, get opportunities to increase the number of collaborators with us and, and, and convince you to join us. So 2020, um, what do you wanna say about it? So I, I asked our group uh, to share their gripes and grudges, you know, as we've had to kind of change the way we work and get to see each other over the past year. And, you know, from broken phones to, you know, staff falling through decks to feeling a bit shabby these days to trying to figure out how we can coexist with our families while we're trying to work remotely. And God forbid, uh, the mute button has been my uh, pain in the butt for quite a past several months. And uh, how many times you've seen people talk and, and forget to unmute. Learning about what a derecho is. If uh, you remember, that feels like an eternity ago when we felt like uh, living out in the far west, uh, the wind picked up in Nebraska and hit us in the face. Uh, or maybe your house is feeling a little bit like a tiny house these days crowded in, in full. Uh, we've heard a lot from our staff about that as well. E-learning to having to do virtual college and not in-person visits for, for uh, graduating teens and, and even having uh, postponed weddings amongst our group to having socially distanced uh, farm-based weddings. Uh, we've had it all and I'm sure your groups have also kind of had to roll with the punches that this year's kind of provided us. Uh, but we've had some great wins. I love the fact that we've been able to get to see um, some Zoom bombs from our uh, families of, of our staff and faculty, and, and including a, a new dog that joined our group. So um, hello, Izzo. Uh, I'm just going to walk through, you know, you know, what we've been doing. Um, despite all of the, the challenges, we've had some fun uh, in the past year. Uh, as you can see, I have a a bit of a fan of the Beatles and on my birthday, I think in April, uh, we got a Zoom call where everybody managed to uh, <laughs> put on a baseball hat since I was feeling pretty shabby back in, at the end of the, at the, end of the month uh, in April. Uh, and uh, apparently my, the Beatles have been wearing on everybody. Uh, to Halloween, you know, trying to find some semblance of, of maintaining a, a, a work environment that, you know, despite the fact that I wish I could see all of you, um, in person and hopefully sooner versus later. Um, it's, it's great to have a lot of wonderful colleagues to, to be able to still be engaged with. So a year and what a year it is uh, in review. So again, I'll give you a brief reintroduction to CARA uh, on this presentation, uh, cover some recent highlights, again, putting faces to names with this presentation so you can get to know us more and, and the many, many great faculty and, and researchers uh, that we've pulled together in CARA, and uh, I'm just so lucky to, to be able to work with. Um, and then also highlight um, an update on our COVID-19 research. Um, back in May, I believe, we presented on our findings from a, 
uh, a first wave of what we call our uh, C3 study. And I'll kind of give you some updates on the many different avenues we've uh, gone since on that work that's continuing now with NIH funding. And then I'm gonna kind of, you know, also highlight for those who have, haven't really been as engaged yet, we have received a new NIA Pepper Center. I'll explain what that is and uh, who's involved in, in the work and many opportunities uh, th uh, throughout Feinberg and Northwestern that hopefully the Pepper Center will be able to provide and make you aware of some uh, opportunities as well that are coming up very, very soon. So Cara, um, it, you know, our center was really launched uh, with IFAM back in September of 2019. And so it's been uh, the development of, of a, a kind of a, an applied health research on aging center has been a, a main, uh, has been happening for a long time. And so we've kind of wanted to give you a sense to, of what we do. You know, our kind of our mantra is promoting informed decision-making and actions for the best health and well-being. Um, that being generic, it's, it's really a, a research that highlights in many ways, and this is uh, the Agents for Healthcare, Healthcare Research and Quality, um, has a multiple chronic conditions framework that I think is very apt for a lot of the work that we do with Ankara. Again, it's applied health research, focusing on complexity imparted by healthcare systems onto patients and families, and how do we do our best to redesign and innovate uh, healthcare services and interactions uh, to really engage patients better and to optimize their function and quality of life. We have six programs specifically that we've kind of initially broken up our, our kind of research agenda into. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, uh, just briefly about them, but everything from a longstanding program known as the Health Literacy and Learning Program that's been around, um, led by Stacy Bailey. Um, uh, organizes research that really is helping to support patients engage and make informed health decisions in the context of their health. Uh, cognitive aging research centered around longstanding cohort studies and, and understanding how specifically cognitive decline and, and poor cognitive function impact self-care. That's led by Laura Curtis. Our psychosocial support program that engages in psychosocial determinants of health and caregiver research led by Rachel O'Connor. Life Course Health, uh, which actually gets at even earlier, um, not just in the later life tra healthcare transitions, but even early life transitions uh, to uh, functional independence and self-care management uh, led by uh, Marina Arbenitas. And then also we have a treatment adherence program focused on a longstanding body of work engaged in uh, medication safety and use, as well as just looking in general about their regimen engagement. Uh, as well as also measurement and analysis uh, program, which brings together our comprehensive, uh, you know, methodological resources uh, led by Mary Kwasny. You know, a quick mention, uh, you know, of help in particular, I was going to highlight because I think this is something that has started to really take off um, in terms of services that might, might be of interest to many of you within our uh, center. Uh, help, you know, has been around since 2004. And it has imparted evidence-based practices in the design of health materials. So how do you, you know, develop uh, health messaging, uh, whether it be in print, multimedia, or, or really kind of any source, uh, and uh, involve patients uh, to get their feedback input, input as, as co-developers of the material, and to then objectively evaluate the health materials. So uh, through user testing, usability testing, to confirm that it, it's appropriate for diverse audiences by literacy level, language, culture, et cetera. Um, help has been providing, and in, in, in 2020 specifically, it, it has really taken off uh, everything from COVID work to just general um, uh, health work. We've been focusing on longstanding industry collaborations uh, to really help people, again, optimize health information, make sure that it's usable, uh, not just understandable, but it's actionable information. And that's something that we've been working with and also in partnership with the National Academy of Medicine, among others, to really kind of cultivate what is the evidence-based practices for doing that. So I wanted to give that, that is led by Stacey Bailey in our division, in our department. We are trying to find ways that we can even help our own healthcare system by looking at materials, uh, helping to you know, focus on patient education and other services. So uh, I would be in contact with Stacey Bailey if you're interested in further learning more about help. 
And stay tuned, you know, just again, this is just a, a quick overview. I'm hoping it's just enough, especially in talking in the next several slides about, you know, the recent highlights of the work that's been happening over the past year uh, and thinking about what CARA is. I think actually showing you what's in our portfolio is the best way to actually describe what CARA is about. Um, and also not even just through some general kind of developments, but also what we've been doing with COVID and also uh, later on with the Pepper Center. But in the meantime, CARA, you know, we are starting to, again, just get traction. We've only been about four or five months old when uh, we shut down with COVID-19 in March. So uh, that hasn't stopped us much, but we are planning to continue to work to think about seed grant funding for research on aging at Northwestern, new research data resources uh, and data sets specifically, works in progress that we'll ho host with through new cats. Uh, targeting, again, and uh, highlighting those of you who are doing work, again, related to research on aging. Uh, developing patient registries to help incorporate and, and identify and, and recruit uh, individuals uh, of, of older, uh, who are older into research studies. And also to, you know, we've been in discussions with um, the Center for Community Health and others about how we can also develop community advisory panels. Uh, to also advise uh, research um, that is focused on um, uh, later life and aging. Uh, Julia Yushino Benevente is our associate director. So please, if you have further interest, and I will come back to this later in the slide, please think about joining us and, and help being an affiliate to our center and, and, help, and help tell us how, you can, how we can best help you and support your research. So on to uh, what has 2020 been about? So I'm sure, again, uh, this has not been the way any of us was hoping uh, to uh, engage in our research. So we've had to kind of pivot multiple times. Um, and so I thought it's still kind of, you know, there's been a lot of uh, real wins, I think, through 2020 that it's worth giving a shout out to. So as many of us, you know, continue to struggle, you know, in figuring out how do we keep our healthcare system open? How do we, especially with a lot of our research with older adults with underlying health conditions, how do we keep our patients uh, who are study participants safe uh, and away from the hospital to not uh, be in the way um, and also to minimize risk for everyone? We had to be able to be a little bit creative. And I think some things that are quite exciting that again, our team has uh, been able to kind of work on uh, to just think about how can we maintain our research activities um, yet keeping patients remote. And uh, two highlights that I want to mention, you know, work that has started, you know, serendipitously before uh, COVID-19 uh, happened was the development and validation of SMS text-based strategies to assess uh, patients' uh, health literacy, and as well, it could be applied to other reported outcomes. Uh, that has been underway and led by Stacey Bailey as well and her team. And I think that's just been a real exciting kind of advancement that we're working on to see how you can actually collect quite a bit of information from something, someone's smartphone. Uh, and another real advancement that we are piloting right now, uh, many of our studies and are focused on assessing medication adherence, and while we've done that before with automated pill counts, looking at polypharmacy issues and having people bring in brown bags of the medications, that just couldn't be possible. And also doing a lot of this work with patients and asking them uh, through prior validated means to actually count what can be, you know, many, many pills across many, many bottles. And then it also poses safety risks. Uh, our team that's uh, focused here, Specifically, I'll call out Giselle Wismer and Pauline Zhang and Aiden Winia that have been really working hard on designing protocols to leverage Zoom platforms and other video-based conferences uh, to actually get patients uh, to be able to share their images of their pills um, and let us do the math for them and the count through, through imagery brought back. That's being piloted right now um, and it's been shared with our data safety and uh, monitoring boards uh, for two studies. Uh, and I think there's still been a lot of excitement about how this could actually move forward and become a, a, a new, easier way to, to capture ob objectively a very complex behavior. In addition, um, what 2020 brought for us surprisingly, and it started about a month before 
you know, the outbreak occurred in Chicago was uh, a longstanding, slowly moving kind of uh, uh, initiative that we've been working on around a universal medication schedule. And, and I've given talks before about this. Uh, since 2006, we've been working on patient-centered prescribing in the context of helping patients get very consistent standard uh, instructions on all their pill bottles that help them kind of start to orient and consolidate um, multi-drug regimens so they can be better, more adherent, and also properly space their medications throughout a day. Uh, we've now had four R01 trials uh, conducted, evaluating it positively uh, in terms of having benefits to patients, improving their knowledge, their dosing, their adherence. Uh, we have two active trials right now working on it. Um, we've been able to partner in, with nationally to look at their own data and show, uh, you know, in a large co in a large study that we published in February of this past year, how prescribing with this universal medication schedule, which follows a pillbox schema of morning and evening and bedtime, instead of using things like every 12 hours or once, twice, three times daily, uh, shows that it actually improves adherence specifically for older adults with polypharmacy concerns and those who are also less educated. Um, and the, the real win for us that's happened during uh, the pandemic has been that Epic uh, has uh, actually uh, been reaching out to work with us to start the process of including um, UMS as the default uh, uh, practice or on SIGs, what are known as physician instructions. So that would be a real kind of uh, excitement for us to say that, you know, during all this time, we are actually are achieving, a, you know, the opportunity for full dissemination. Just uh, the pill bottle that I show right there too is not Walgreens, it's actually CVS. And the idea of the UMS actually was launched, I believe at the beginning of 2019, um, as on the new label, they use a, a graphic image of the UMS to help patients better dose out their medicines. And that also kind of happened around the same time. So we feel like it's starting to get some traction. Uh, a lot of activity we've been working on has also focused on cognitive impairment in primary care. And uh, with wonderful new partners over the past few years, so they're not so much new anymore, uh, Richard Gershon and Sidney Nowinski in medical social sciences, among others, uh, we've done some great work on uh, collaborating around a National Institutes for Health consortium called Detect CID to develop a scalable paradigm for routine detection of cognitive impairment attached to annual wellness visits in diverse primary care settings. Um, and also now have a second collaboration with a Jumbo R01 <coughs> that is uh, now funded as of this past fall, uh, doing that will conduct a large scale health system wide pragmatic trial testing effect the effectiveness of an uh, NIH toolbox derived cognitive assessment uh, and its ability to, to better detect and manage cognitive impairment in primary care. And with Laura Curtis specifically, we also have a partnership that was newly funded uh, this year with uh, to leverage natural language processing and automated speech recognition to routinely detect cognitive impairment. So a, a big bucket of work that's kind of developed over the past uh, several months uh, and uh, continuing on from earlier years with uh, what's called the Detect CID network. Uh, network. Um, this has become a, a nice kind of area that's been consolidated within, uh, within our group. Similarly, uh, work that may, some of you may know, I presented the work before too on LitCog. Uh, LitCog is a cohort study that initi was initiated in 2007 and we were following uh, diverse, well-characterized cohort of older adults. Uh, in 2007, they were 55 and 74, and uh, that have one or more chronic conditions now. Um, the majority have multiple chronic conditions. Uh, this study has been ongoing since 2007, and it's been renewed as of this year. Uh, so we'll be able to follow patients for nearly 20 years. And the sample, it really is focusing on investigating cognitive decline and its impact on self-management capacity, functional status, and clinical outcomes. We have full access to EHR data as well as pharmacy records. Uh, and also this time around, we have included a parallel caregiver cohort. Uh, that So these diet interviews are, are being launched as we speak. So now I'm gonna talk 
pivot briefly to another, it's, it's both a highlight, but also um, kind of a, a larger research agenda to itself. Uh, and it's kind of a follow-up to my presentation um, with IFAM uh, earlier this year. Uh, and this is what is the Chicago COVID-19 and comorbidity study. And I thought we'd give you an update uh, since this has been a major um, workload for CARA uh, over the past nine months. We launched the, the study in, I think we designed it in March 4th, launched it on March 13th. Um, when we knew, uh, if you can even remember back then, what it was like, uh, you know, we were preparing to, to go remote and, and had uh, our entire CARA team prepare to kind of create a cohort from cohorts. Uh, our main research questions were really, how are middle-aged and older adults with underlying health conditions at higher risk for adverse outcomes from COVID-19 responding to the pandemic? And specifically, what if any consequences of COVID-19 do we see on these individuals' health status, their access to care, and just in general, their ability to self-manage these chronic conditions? This was a telephone-based survey that we launched again, March starting at March 13. Uh, it has currently four waves completed. Uh, uh, again, this is a cohort that we've been following specifically, and this is again, well characterized. We have data that reflects their health status prior to um, uh, COVID-19 and will extend far beyond it. And wave five actually started on Monday of this week. There's five parent studies with uniform data collection, again, all with EHR access for us. All patients had one or, under, one or more underlying health conditions and they were recruited from five different academic practices as well as two federally qualified health centers. And I wanna give a, a, head, a head nod to uh, Lauren Obsesnik, Stephanie Bat uh, Bateo, uh, Mary Kwasny and Laura Curtis, who's been our uh, research team, our analytics leads for this study, and they've been phenomenal working on this. And these are the studies you can kind of see. Again, I presented this earlier, just as a reminder of who's all involved in this study. Yeah, uh, and you know, we've got participants that are coming from all, either from primary care practices, we even involve patients from, who are immunocompromised coming from uh, the Solid Organ Transplant Center. Uh, some patients that have uh, specifically uh, type two diabetes, some with COPD, um, most of these patients all have complex medication regimens um, and some level of medical complexity. When I was creating this and updating this slide, uh, it did does give you a, a very stark look at what's happened. Um, when I presented the last time, we had just gotten through wave two. And now when you look at the numbers, both in the cases in Illinois, deaths, uh, as well as cases in the U.S. and total deaths, it, it just shows the the sadness of of what's been happening. And and as we launched, and I even added to wave five, um, you know, you start to see, you know, assessing how, you know, I think the research questions are are quite important for us to continue to to survey this cohort uh, as the environment is clearly changing dramatically in terms of uh, the impact of COVID on society. So for the 3C study, we did get a LipCog COVID supplement. So this is another highlight I think that we can talk about is we got a large COVID-19 supplement from the NIA. Um, it'll span two years going through July, 2022. And what we are doing now is we are starting to space out more surveys. We're gonna to continue to follow the C3 study, which includes all five parent study participants, a total of 673, 153 being from LipCog. And we have plans to do nine waves of surveys to capture everything from uh, their involvement in telehealth, uh, how frequently they're getting labs done, um, or if they're missing appointments. You know, are they being? You know, are there groups that are being left out um, uh, given uh, how healthcare access has changed over the time? Uh, and also, as well as just looking at their health outcomes, we'll be studying all of this uh, over a. a, a two and a half year window over at the, by the end of the day. But we're also including more participants from LipCog since it was attached to the LipCog parent grant, the supplement was. So in general, we'll, we're expecting to add in as many as 250 new participants uh, who will have their first uh, involvement with our study, our survey at wave five 
uh, moving on through wave nine, and that'll be attached to ongoing uh, data collection efforts as part of the parent study for LookCog as well. And a lot of that also gets at not just the impact on healthcare access and use and, and clinical uh, chronic disease outcomes, but also looking at the impact of cognitive of, of, of COVID-19 on cognitive outcomes as well. Some updates on findings since uh, we last were with you to, to talk about this study. Uh, you know, there's been a, a, a we had a we have one paper right now that is under revision at the Journal of General Medicine, Medicine that we did late breaking to capture with wave two and wave three data, uh, an emphasis on our first peek at looking at how individuals with chronic conditions are addressing self-care behaviors during COVID-19. Some major findings, we found that one in five participants reported being stressed all or most of the time during COVID-19. One in three were engaged in hazardous drinking according to the audit C. 80% uh, reported insufficient physical activity according to BRFSS items. One in four, you know, are stated they were avoiding medical care due to worry about COVID-19 even when they need it. And, you know, grave, the COVID-related stress became a new feature for us uh, under study uh, because those who were reporting being stressed all or most of the time during COVID-19 was associated with less physical activity, greater self-reported difficulty managing their health, and also reporting having avoided medical care due to concerns around the coronavirus. Interestingly, you know, men reported less stress on this variable, but were more likely to heavily drink. Another findings, um, as a, you know, similarly on the physical activity note, I did want to give a, a, a head nod to uh, uh, Sophia Weiner Light, who's a new doctoral student this fall in clinical psychology, who uh, has a paper coming out in JAGS, the Journal of American Geriatric Society. Uh, where it was folk, her focus and interests are that is kind of a new agenda for us is screen based physical activity tools are the current recommendations causing more harm than good. So, our interests are really focused on how, uh, you know, what is positive and what is negative screen time, you know, in terms of um, for, for older adults uh, and on how does that affect uh, their physical activity versus sedentary behavior and also their impact on cognition. We have, you know, other issues around self-management. Uh, there's, uh, we're working with uh, Daniela Lautner at the Transplant Center, uh, you know, attached to one of the grant, uh, the studies that's linked to C3. Uh, the focus that our team is looking at right now is kidney transplant recipients, their response to COVID-19. So working with our um, transplant research team, uh, they're examining trends and knowledge, attitudes and behaviors from the initial outbreak of COVID-19 back in March, all the way through the end of summer, through the end of August, um, and specifically exploring disparities by race and gender among uh, new transplant recipients. In addition, uh, CARA maintains a strong partnership uh, with the doctoral program in clinical psychology through psychiatry and behavioral sciences here at Feinberg and uh, working with Rebecca Lovett, who's a postdoctoral fellow within CORA and also our three doctoral students. Uh, we basically, uh, they, they took a look in, at how COVID-19 is impacting mental health. Some of their late breaking findings right now that are under review uh, is that the prevalence of clinically relevant anxiety and depression as measured by promise measures um, were considerably high. Uh, and both were independent, both anxiety and depression were both independently associated with greater COVID related emotional distress, difficulty in managing health, poor treatment adherence, and also self care capacity. And anxiety specifically was associated with more time spent viewing COVID related news, less comfort resuming daily activities, and a greater likelihood of using telehealth. I wanted to also highlight work by our colleague Rachel O'Connor. Uh, Soon after, I think uh, my last presentation, her publication came out uh, that was really looking at a, a deep dive of uh, both doing qualitative and quantitative analyses of participants' responses to how they were reacting to COVID-19. I just wanted to highlight this paper that came out uh, earlier, but she's been moving on and taking on a really great new agenda focused on caregiver support and, and unmet needs among older adults uh, in terms of they may be getting support, but if it's still not meeting the tangible needs they have with regards to their self-care. And she found, again, a decent prevalence of a, a number of adults having unmet needs. 
Um, and during COVID that, you know, unmet needs is really linked to, greater, again, greater difficulty managing health and also their medication regimens, being more anxious and depressed, having worse treatment adherence and overall uh, poor well-being. So her work is um, a really exciting new agenda and also very focused on, you know, addressing modifiable factors to improve uh, patient engagement and care. Marina Arvanitis um, also is, uh, has work under review. Uh, we did address issues around confidence and intent to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. And, you know, some of the work that she's highlighting right now coming out of our survey, and I believe that was at the Wave 3 survey, was disparities by race and age uh, that she noted with regards to expectations of safety and efficacy for an eventual vaccine, and also whether and, and disparities by who is likely to get vaccinated. Uh, and one of the things that I thought was interesting with her work is also looking at the role of uh, an individual's confidence in the federal government's uh, COVID-19 response as possibly a, a mechanism through which it's kind of determining uh, expectations of safety and also uh, the likelihood of getting a vaccine. So I'm going to take the final few minutes um, to really highlight, is, which has been a wonderful uh, win for us and for Northwestern in, in 2020, despite um, uh, all of that's happening around us right now and having such a changing environment for us, uh, is the Northwestern Pepper Center got funded. Um, uh, the Northwestern Pepper Center is uh, part of what is the Claude D. Pepper Older Americans Independent Center, a long, very, very long standing uh, research network. Uh, of P30 uh, center grants across the, the country um, that we are one of the, we are the first new member uh, to the Pepper Center Network uh, in several years. And so for this uh, to, to kind of land was uh, an amazing win for us. And, and I hope it's a, a resource that many of you might find beneficial to your own work. Uh, our leadership also includes uh, Dr. Jeffrey Linder, uh, Lee Lindquist, and also one uh, our, our administrative leadership team, which is also Julia Shina Benevente, Angela O'Donnell, and Giselle Wismer. So what do Pepper Centers do? So uh, again, these OAICs or Pepper Centers um, are really the, you know, again, right off of the NIA website, you know, this, this long-standing uh, Pepper Center network has a focus on geriatrics research expertise and collaboration. Uh, they serve as sources of data, biospecimens, and aging research tools. Uh, they're sites for training and aging-related research, which is really a cornerstone for Pepper Centers, and also venues for dissemination of geriatric health information. You can see, uh, until, until now, um, there was a heavy emphasis on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, and so we joined, really, uh, University of Michigan as kind of the the new Midwest entry, and also the first time Chicago has been represented in the Pepper Center Network. Um, and so we're very, very excited to, to kind of bring um, our region into the mix. Each Pepper Center has its own theme. Uh, it can be basic or translational, or in our case, more health services re research related. And, you know, we're drawing on the strengths that we have throughout Feinberg and also throughout the entire university the mission of our Pepper Center is to generate innovative research that will enhance primary care specifically for medically complex older adults with multiple chronic conditions to achieve optimal health function, independence, and quality of life. And we have kind of like a, a dual aim to both identify various clinical healthcare system and social environmental determinants of chronic disease outcomes and quality of life among again, more medically complex older adults with multiple chronic conditions. And the key word here too is modifiable factors, uh, things that we can use as targets of intervention and, and ideally to really preserve function uh, among these more frail individuals. But the other aim really is also, again, is to develop these interventions that can, in fact, uh, be informed by you know, more observational studies and to design practical, scalable primary care management strategies that align with patient priorities um, and improve health outcomes over time. Uh, you can see how we're situated within the Chicago community, not just Northwestern. Um, 
We include uh, additional academic partners within our Pepper Center that we do outreach with, including the Roybal Center, also another NIA Behavioral and Social Science uh, Center of Excellence, uh, led by Susan Hughes, as well as uh, Rush University's Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Uh, we brought on board Alison Arwadi of the CDPH and also the Illinois Department of Aging. And Northwestern Memorial Healthcare is obviously a main clinical partner as well as Shirley Ryan. And I uh, just wanted to make one mention because clearly we're heavily linked into the Department of Medicine. Um, CARA itself is situated within general internal medicine and geriatrics. Um, but we're also heavily uh, thankful to have a great deal of support from NUCATS. So, and I really wanted to give a shout out to Christy Holmes uh, for, with Galter Health Sciences, who's just been an amazing collaborator for us, both in helping us in the development of this award, um, but also in, in the post-award space now, really kind of helping us launch um, many new aging research resources uh, that will hopefully benefit many of us uh, and Northwestern and beyond. I mentioned that the Pepper Center has uh, a research education mission and uh, very true. So the research education component uh, led by Sarah Bradley and Alan Heinemann. Um, and also it links to what we have is a pilot exploratory studies core led by Mary McDermott and Emily Rogalski. And uh, combined over the next five years, we will be funding 15 Pepper Scholars. Um, each Pepper Scholar gets two year awards and there's two types of awards that I'll explain in a minute. Um, so in this year, we've already chosen the first five of those Pepper Scholars um, and those will, uh, the competing, the competition will start soon for uh, the second cycle and then there'll be a third cycle in, in our third year. Um, each, uh, so each, the uh, Pepper Scholar can get, there's two different awards and two different mechanisms that we'll be launching. The first will be uh, three uh, awards will go to scholars who will receive the equivalent of an RO3 pilot award. So over two years, they'll get $100,000 to develop work that will hopefully lead them to their maybe a larger R mechanism award as an independent investigator or even a K award. Um, uh, a second competition will choose two additional Pepper Scholars who will receive mini Ks, uh, which will be giving up basically a day a week of protected time over two years, as well as support from uh, a, a Pepper Center chosen mentor team and resources that they'll have access to in terms of methodological and substantive expertise uh, within our uh, section of geriatrics and also with our collaboration of our analytics core. Um, as I mentioned, the cycle one Pepper Scholars have been identified, but just to put it on your radar, that cycle two call for proposals for the pilot awards will happen in January of 2021, most likely. Um, and so we will make sure to uh, get it on the radar as, and distribute that as widely as possible, but we'll be looking for the competition, uh, uh, a competitive submission process uh, to, to launch then and, and to be awarded in the summer. I uh, wanna recognize our first wave of Pepper Scholars. Uh, so uh, Miriam Rafferty from Shirley Ryan, Rachel O'Connor, uh, Katie O'Brien and Teresa Rowe who are based in general trauma medicine and geriatrics and Saad Sadia Khan who's in preventive medicine. Uh, uh, we're, we all received two year awards this round. And so we're very, very much looking forward to working with them and have already engaged them and in, in chosen their mentor teams. In addition to uh, the research education component and complementary to it, we also, uh, with Pepper, will be launching three resource cores or have launched three resource cores that really uh, are also provide the flavor of how our Pepper Center is different than from other Pepper Centers and what resources our Northwestern Center will be able to contribute to the national network as well. Um, so we, it begins with our healthcare and technology design uh, core, which is led by David Moore and Emily Laddie. And basically that core will be focused on how to optima, optimally design uh, technologies, consumer and healthcare based technologies, uh, specifically for older adults and their caregivers. Uh, the measurement core led by David Sella, Dan Rosick and Devin Pipert um, in medical social sciences will really be leveraging their vast expertise in patient reported outcomes measurement 
and finding ways that we can kind of infuse that into the healthcare system, especially in primary care practices that are less resourced. Uh, less resourced. And then we also have a very unique data analytics core that uh, addresses mixed methods. So we include both the quantitative expertise of Leah Welty, who heads up the BCC that many of you uh, already may use, as well as Kenzie Cameron and General General Medicine Geriatrics, whose uh, leadership when, on the qualitative data analysis is, is we're really excited to, to bring on board. And Eleanor Small and, and Lori Hedlund, uh, I wanted to give acknowledgement to them, are also providing great leadership and, and administrative leadership to these cores. So a last thing to mention about the Pepper Center uh, that, we're, that we now are underway with is the Pepper Center, much like the Alzheimer's Center with Mesalem, you know, brings uh, the network, uh, our Pepper Center is one more entry into um, the Research Center's Collaborative Network, or RCCN, of NIA that really gives us unique opportunities to find collaborations and partnerships at a national level with other high-tier institutions that have various awards, whether it be the Roybal Centers I mentioned earlier, like UIC, Alzheimer's Centers, uh, Rick Mars, which are research centers focused on minority age, uh, aging research, and among others, uh, the Nathan Schock Centers and others. So I think this is a great yet uh, another additional representation for us within the RCCN. Another mention about the National OAIC, the Pepper Center Network, uh, continually offers uh, RFAs specifically for Pepper Center members. So there are opportunities for us to get additional funding, uh, you know, whether it be for um, uh, uh, infrastructure support or for additional research uh, funding, especially if it's focused around junior investigator support. Um, or, and also the, older, the OAIC, the National Network um, uh, fund, uh, that's coordinated by Wake Forest also provides funding opportunities to send junior faculty uh, on visiting scholarships to other Pepper Senators to get to meet their faculty and learn from them as well uh, and hopefully bridge collaborations. And finally, you know, the Pepper Centers are, um, they, there's a, a companion uh, project uh, to the Pepper Center called the Aging Initiative led by Jerry Gerwitz at Matt University of Massachusetts and also uh, Jay Magaziner at University of Maryland, which is focused specifically on uh, the management of older patients with multiple chronic conditions. And I was just on the phone with him yesterday, uh, you know, because there's a great deal of excitement about our Pepper Center specifically because of our theme. Uh, and that also brings together additional funds and resources and other funding opportunities that hopefully um, we'll be able to take advantage of. So with all of that, uh, that I've tried to cover quickly in this time, uh, you know, I'm hoping, uh, you know, th through CARA, you'll be able to become a member uh, of both the, of not just our center, but also the Pepper Center as well and, and get you on our list serve. So when we do have uh, announcements um, and funding opportunities that may be just in time, We'd love to be able to share them with you if it fits your research agenda. So I'm gonna stop here and if there's any questions or comments, I'm happy to answer them. But more importantly, I hope everybody uh, stay safe and uh, we really are looking forward to finding out ways in which you can tell us how we can support your research on aging. Uh, and hopefully again, you'll, you'll be a part of CARA. Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. So for anybody who might have questions, just use the little Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen uh, as opposed to the chat. It's a lot easier to manage. So I'll pose one of the first questions we got. Uh, is the Pepper Scholars Program only open to junior faculty or can postdoc fellows also apply? So that's a great question and we hear a lot about it too. So right now, I think um, we are trying to make sure that both uh, to the national network and also, um, you know, we want to be, be able to find the best people possible that, um, you know, are very promising. So we're trying to not limit it. Uh, and so we went in with our application specifically feeling that we wanted to uh, have a preference for junior faculty who we could use this as uh, a means to get them to their next um, career, uh, the, trajectory, the trajectory in their career. And I think that would obviously apply for fellows. Um, so if they were, uh, I think 
my guess would be that do not think that you should hesitate to submit uh, a candidate uh, or that they should apply that we won't be that uh, stringent. Our group is still kind of working on it, but even to the point on the flip end of it, if there are established faculty who are trying to transition to aging research uh, that have traditionally to this point, maybe not had such a focus on aging in their, in their portfolio, uh, those are other individuals that we feel like they should be able to submit to our, our competition. Um, we haven't completely ruled out fellows yet, but especially if they're like in their final year of a fellowship and they're using this as a transition to a faculty appointment, I would probably encourage you to reach out to us for sure. Great. Um, so although the pandemic has uprooted a lot of what we consider normal, have you seen anything to suggest that people are better adhering to complex medication schedules because they are at home more often? So that's a very interesting question. And to our, I think that is something we have not specifically looked into, but we do have the data for, um, uh, in a, many of our studies that are parent, that are um, participants that are in the C3 study um, are, are part of studies in which we are investigating at a very granular level, how patients, not just if they're adherent or not, but specifically at the level of medications, how they're dosing out their medications, organizing their schedules and so forth. So um, there's a possibility we could answer that question, but we have no signal to, our, to my knowledge as of yet to see if patients are actually uh, improving more because their schedules are more routine. Um, and I would also highlight that that is a, a research agenda interest of uh, Rachel O'Connor in our group as well, um, looking at older adults and specifically not just the caregiving support around their medication self-management um, activities, but also how patients themselves are engaging in, in, in routine uh, and the importance of routine on, on health. So I would probably encourage you to also reach out to Rachel if you have further interest. And also, uh, we're also willing to share the C3 study data set um, to, to a degree. Um, you know, there, we really are looking for anybody. There's so much data that we're capturing and, and we'll continue to capture. So if you would have interest in, in collaborating with us, um, please reach out on that regard too, not just on the Pepper Center. Okay. Um, in terms of the C3 study, what do you see as the biggest surprise? So on the C3 study, I think the interesting thing that's happened for us is at the, again, thinking about going back with um, my initial conversations about the idea of doing this study with Stacy Bailey in our, in our group, um, you know, it, it was really going to be a focus at the time on, you know, the work that we're most interested in as like on the self-management side on how are people um, accessing healthcare? Um, are they struggling to manage their chronic conditions further? You know, and thinking about how this, how we were thinking this was all going to play out. And I think what really has become, you know, and you, it's what you see in the news, everything. Um, I think what our evidence suggests is what you hear in the news, um, maybe not so much supported by evidence, that this is a story, uh, a very strong behavioral health story. There's a lot of mental health issues that are coming aboard. Um, people are becoming, uh, there are a lot of depressive and anxiety symptoms that we're seeing, a lot of worry and distress, uh, you know, due to COVID. And it's that mechanism that really seems to be um, main, the main theme that we're hearing in, in our interviews. Um, we expanded our study with partners um, in Louisiana, in New York, uh, in New Haven. Um, we've got partners internationally as well. And the story that we're getting from them is very, very similar. And, oh yeah. Okay. I see a comment that, popped up for me on social isolation and loneliness. Um, yeah, we are, we, you know, again, we do have questions about patients, uh, our participants that relate to social isolation, that relate to loneliness. Um, surprisingly in our studies, um, loneliness um, has not uh, emerged when you ask patients of how often have they felt lonely, um, that that has not been a, a very major theme specifically, even though I, you know, we've been hearing about it both through research we've heard through the Pepper Center and, and other areas too, and, and it makes sense. 
Um, but when you ask people about their behaviors around social distancing, leaving, how often they leave the house, how often they encounter other people, and knowing that this is a group of uh, individuals uh, who are older, predominantly older, and also have multiple chronic conditions, you would think that that theme would probably emerge more. Um, we're going to continue to study it, though, but, you know, it might be also a measurement issue because, you know, it, they may not be saying that they're lonely, but yet when you assess them uh, on their anxiety and depression symptoms and their level of uh, perceived stress, um, the story is a bit different. Um, so one other question, how has COVID changed the way you interact with your research collaborators? <laughs> well, um, you know, definitely not in person. Uh, you know, if, if you think of research collaborators versus research participants, um, to answer it both, I think uh, a lot of our research, you know, uh, as I showed you at the very beginning of the slides, um, having Zoom meetings with 30 faces, um, you know, uh, that you're, you're staring at on a screen is definitely different than our in-person meetings. I'm sure it's for everybody. Um, and I think we've also engaged more, um, uh, more frequently as a group than we had, you know, in, in some regards. And that's changed over the course of the time. I think with our research participants and how we just do research in general, uh, and we've been talking across the university, I think for many of us on how do you innovate? How do you try to find ways that allow you to still contribute meaningful research that'll inform the healthcare system, that'll support patients and improve their quality of life and, and hopefully, you know, some great lessons learned. Um, it's, you know, we've had to pivot. A lot of our work, you know, to keep patients safe can't be done the way we normally have done it. And, um, and so we are not seeing people in person. Um, that's challenging when you're trying to do cognitive assessments. Um, but uh, I would say in just another uh, mention to the work that's that uh, we've been very very fortunate to work with uh, medical social sciences um, Cindy Nowinski and Richard Gershon you know this you know thinking about how a lot of long-standing well-validated well-used uh, tools like the NIH toolbox can be uh, administered remotely through telehealth platforms I think that's really uh, some exciting new changes that we've been able to engage in um, so uh, I'll leave it at that well, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, I put in a number of links in the chat. So if anybody wants to just go ahead and save the chat um, to some of the, the, you know, to become a member of any of the IFAM centers, there's a, a membership form for new cats. I put a link to the upcoming uh, seminar series for the IFAM seminar series. Um, and also if you wanna follow any of these, any of these uh, handles on Twitter. So I put all of those links in the chat. And thank you so much, Mike. It was wonderful. Great. Be well. Bye.